turn with me to Mark chapter 10, um, verse 32. So we'll read from. If you don't, or use your phone, uh, don't worry, I'm going to put it on the screen. You might need keen eyes, very small fonts. Um, Self-sacrifice. Um, we take a lot of time on a day like today to think really about what that means. Um, obviously if you're here at the morning service, Matthew really helpfully unpacked it. But what is it that comes to your mind on a day like today um, when you think of self-sacrifice? Um, for me, the first thing that came to my mind um, was the guy who jumps on the grenade um, to basically protect, use his body as protection for his, his friends, his fellow soldiers. That's funny, when I, I spoke to Tim in the week, um, he thought exactly the same uh, example um, right off the bat. And that is an absolutely incredible sacrifice, an incredible self-sacrifice. But a self-sacrifice like that, there is about a thousand steps uh, before that point. A self-sacrifice like that, it doesn't come out uh, nowhere. One of the ideas we're going to be unpacking tonight is self-sacrifice is actually something it's a choice we face every day um, in how we um, live to others. When I was preparing this, I thought I was going to... Um, actually, some people know, last weekend I was able to uh, move in finally uh, with my wife Katie into her own place. It kind of in the end of the long process. Uh, and I thought I'd be standing here with some uh, great examples of how I've been uh, self-serving this week. Uh, you know, kind of practicing what I've been looking into, practicing what um, but as I was reflecting the week um, yesterday morning, uh, half past eight in the morning, wondering, actually, what have I done that's been a great example of self-sacrifice here? I rolled over and I realized that my wife Katie wasn't even there. She'd actually gotten up already. Um, I could hear her washing the dishes in the kitchen um, while simultaneously on hold um, to, for the energy company to get proof of residential address so we could open a joint bank account uh, together. And I realized that she really self-sacrifice for them than I have. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, um, you able to get that out Prince? Working on it. No, I have to get your phones or files if you can just start. Okay, so we're taking off from Jesus for us of death the third time. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand, or my left, is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him, and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. 
And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him. We get told how the disciples respond. At the end of the, the first foretelling, Peter actually tries to rebuke Jesus for what he was saying and gets absolutely lambasted by him. At the end of the second foretelling, we're told they were afraid to ask him. And it's really no surprise there after the tongue lashing uh, Peter and God. This time, though, uh, there are two disciples that are bold enough to ask something of Jesus. So, what is it they ask? They start with, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Now, Jesus must know something's up. You, we learn this pretty quickly on the school program. Whenever someone asks you, will you do whatever we want you to do? You never say yes to that. <laughs> but how does he answer them? 
Remember, he's focused on the suffering. He's coming his way to solve the challenge. He answers with these words, what do you want me to do for you? He takes his eyes off the humiliation that's ahead of him and puts himself at James and John's service. Of course, this isn't the first time we've seen such behavior from Jesus. Remember back to when Jesus was grieving John's death. He left a remote area on a boat alone to grieve. But what happened? A crowd followed him, and out of compassion, he stepped onto the land, healed their sick, taught them, and fed all 5,000 of them with five loaves of bread and two fish. He takes his eyes off his own suffering to, uh, to the people in need. So what is it they actually ask him then? They say, grant to us, I'm sorry, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now from previous weeks, you'll know that disciples haven't really been getting uh, what Jesus is all about. And I think with this request, we really see that they, they still haven't got it. Um, firstly, they've made the mistake of um, asking for seats that are already prepared to be able to find out. And secondly, they're not actually um, his to grant to Jesus, point said. He defaults to the, the Father's authority on um, granting these seats. So how have they misunderstood this? Why they're still seeing Jesus strictly as a political liberator in Israel. And they're asking for seats next to him um, when Jesus would rule in Jerusalem on the throne of David. They're maybe even thinking that if Jesus really is going to die and be raised in Jerusalem, this might be the last good opportunity to put in request for future signs. Jesus then goes on to ask them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized? Now what's the cup and the baptism Jesus is referring to here? The cup that he was to drink was the cup of God's wrath that would be poured out on him, bearing God's wrath in the place of sinful mankind. Whereas the baptism was his suffering and death, which would uh, come over him like a flood. James and John, however, understand Jesus' question to mean that they will need to fight alongside Jesus. And their answer is brave. They say, we are able. And Jesus then teaches them that yes, they too will undergo a form of suffering when he says, cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism I am baptized, you will be baptized. But their suffering will be different to his, in what it achieves. Their suffering will be for their own purification, for God's glory, but his will be for something much, much more. James and John's request, and they're brave in, in asking, they're bold in asking, and you know, they're brave in going to fight for him, but it is an ultimately self-serving request. They want to be elevated alongside Jesus to positions of honour when glory comes. And they're right that the glory is coming, and it will be so much better than they can, they can fathom. But Jesus is trying to get through to them that yes, and glory will come, uh, but there will be suffering and humiliation first. Also, as the word out, there's only two seats beside Jesus. So their request isn't them just asking to be honoured. They're actually asking to be honoured above the other disciples and everyone else too. Their request isn't looking to, sell, uh, to serve others, but to serve themselves, self-serving. But let's not be too harsh on James and John here, because aren't we guilty of that same selfishness at times? Like James and John, we are guilty of craving recognition too. We can crave recognition in our studies, in our workplaces. Um, we can even crave recognition in our ministries. Crave recognition from our partners, our parents, our partners' parents, our teachers, our bosses, our spiritual mentors, our friends. We crave recognition in a whole host of areas, from a whole host of people. We seem to say, recognize how brilliant the students I am, recognize how loyal a friend I am, recognize how servant hearted I am, recognize how humble I am. <laughs> and it's not even just the major accomplishments that we want recognition and praise, we do it in the small things also. I know when I've washed up the dishes before Katie's got home, I want recognition for how awesome a husband I am. <laughs> or even worse, I think, is when I let someone out to the junction and they don't flash their lights to say thanks. I'm incensed. <laughs> I want recognition for my incredible kindness of that I'm just, just one person. Just one person. That's the limit. <laughs> and how do the rest of the disciples react to James and John's request? Well, we're told they were indignant. And is that not exactly how we react to self-serving in others? We get so frustrated with our fellow students who try to free ride on our efforts and group projects. We get angry at those who are willing to do whatever it takes to rise up to the workplace, 
throwing colleagues under the bus we get angry at self serving behaviors from our, our elected politicians self serving behaviors and others great on us like not much else can so what could what should we do with that indignation one could say everyone else is only out for themselves so i might as well be too we hear that don't we or we can listen to what jesus says next now my uh, ESV study bible also suggested that actually part of the disciples indignation is perhaps on account of their own ambition and jealousy and as jesus calls all the disciples over to correct them not just james and john and um, yeah, they, they may not be awesome and how does jesus start he says you know that those who are considered rulers of the gentiles lord it over them jesus starts by exposing the misuse of human authority not because he wants to end it but because he wants to contrast it with um, the service he's calling us to calling us to it shall not be among you he says for whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all leadership amongst god's people should be characterized by the serving of others not by assuming that people are there to serve the leaders while james and john were serving themselves in their request jesus teaches that we're to serve each other while those who serve themselves put themselves at the center those who seek to serve others are to be other centered. That's the foundation for self sacrifice and self sacrificial behavior. So, why is he teaching this? this? Other centeredness is a counter cultural message in a world that pushes on us that we should be self centered. Within the world that comes up with such wisdom as look out for number one. Who's number one? It's me. Look at the social media, even our generation could say. It's all about me. Look at how great I look. Look at the cool things I'm doing. Look at how awesome I am. Social media even preaches that the key to happiness is working on ourselves. Let's hit the gym. Let's travel the world. Let's get that high paying job. And should be no surprise that our generation puts out dumb slogans like, be kind, it costs nothing. Or should they're well practiced and self serving rings true? Why should I be kind if it's not if it's going to cost me something? But the answer to that is only if it benefits me more than what it costs me. But here's the rub. True kindness costs something. It requires sacrificing something we value. It could be time, money, opportunity, whatever. There's a whole list of things. And it's subjective as well. Subjective. And Jesus calls us to this self-sacrificial behaviour. Why? And because that's what he's all about. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And there's that title again, Son of Man, both human and exalted in glory. He came not to be served, and this is what the disciples have been getting all along these past few weeks. He's flipping their expectations of, uh, of the Messiah upside down. He's not coming to be that king that lords it over his subjects, but to serve. He's the servant king, and he's here to inaugurate his reign with the greatest example of service ever seen. He's here to give his life as a ransom for many. This king will be different. He will lay down his life for his people. It's us. He will drink that cup of God's wrath that will be poured out on him. Why? So that we don't have to. He will be baptized in suffering and death so that we don't have to. If you like, you can say he's jumped on the grenade so that we don't get hit by the explosion. Why? Why has he done all this? It's to give his life as a ransom for many. We were slaves in our sins, and this king gave his life to pay the price to redeem us, to bring us out of bondage and into eternal glory with him. What a king. And we come to the last parts of our passage and we find a blind beggar sitting by the roadside the lens of the world and insignificance remember this is actually the second blind man we've come across in mark the first we saw two weeks ago when jesus did that kind of gross thing of spitting on his eyes and laid hands on him and then when he opened his eyes remember he could see but he could only see people that looked like trees and then jesus laid his hands on him again and he could see clearly. And we were left with that question, did Jesus uh, um, 
that his, his miracle failed the first time, but we eventually concluded that it was really to show um, the disciples not quite getting it, um, but eventually coming together. Now this uh, Bartimaeus, he catches wind that Jesus is coming by, and he cries out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And immediately the crowd tries to shut this insignificant down. Why? You almost feel like they're saying, get out of the way. Pipe down. This is Jesus of Nazareth. You're just a blind beggar. Nevertheless, he cries out again. He's determined, son of David, have mercy on me. This time Jesus hears him. But what is it that makes him stop? It's that title, Son of David, and those with ears will know the prophecy he's referring. This is the prophecy to which Bartimaeus is referring. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, the son of David, shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will never depart from him. And as I took it away from Saul, Ah, so I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Those words, almost a thousand years earlier, are pointing to Jesus. And Bartimaeus gets it by calling him the son of David, and he proclaims it. And Jesus, struck by someone recognizing him for who he is, then calls to him. I note the crowd's attitude changes as soon as Jesus pays attention to him. Next slide, friends. Jesus asked them this question. What do you want me to do for you? Now, if you've been paying attention, and realize that's the second time you've heard those words. And just as Jesus gave James and John a chance to express themselves and reveal their misunderstanding, he gives this blind beggar a chance to express himself and reveal his faith. For I think, uh, I think Jesus would have understood what he was going to ask, so we, that's why He's giving them the, the, the Bartimaeus the opportunity to express his faith. What does he say? He says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. He recognizes that it's totally within Jesus' power to give him his sight. And this time, there's no spitting on the eyes, and there's no need to seemingly partially heal him and then heal him properly. Um, but with Bartimaeus, though, he gets it. By citing the, um, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Samuel, he's got who Jesus is. Bartimaeus also gives us the answer uh, to who are the many that Jesus gives his life as a ransom for. Why, it's those who have faith in him alone. Jesus is not interested in those external things such as status, wealth, appearance. He's interested in what was on the inside, a heart of faith. Now most of us here um, have professed faith um, already, so where is the challenge in this passage like this tonight? Jesus has drank the cup and being baptized with the baptism it means our ransom has been paid. It's the gospel. So let's not say that his sacrifice isn't enough by feeling continually guilty by falling short, and but with the same joy as Bartimaeus, the blind beggar. I don't know if you spotted that. But let's spring to keep with Jesus. That's what it says when he comes to Jesus. He springs up. Let's look to this example. Let's look to his example. Philippians 2 helps. Um, aid our understanding um, of, of the power of looking towards Jesus' the example of the cross. It says this, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So let us do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. For each of you, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, we're not to count others more significant than ourselves, because they are more significant, they're not. 
But in following Christ's example, we're to treat with um, each other as if they're more um, significant than ourselves, because that's what Jesus did with us. That was Jesus' example of humility that we are to follow. What are some practical ways we can be self-sacrificial in our lives? Then? One of the most obvious ones, I think, is to join ministry teams at Church Street. For example, joining the children's ministry, you're foregoing um, watching the morning service so that parents who otherwise wouldn't get to watch the service can. I find real challenges in, in being self-sacrificial in our connectors. I remember Grant leading a group on mobile phones and how by sacrificing time on our mobile phones we could give more time and energy and attention uh, to those around us. Uh, this term, my kind of has been really challenging um, as we've been looking at climate change, but how can we be self-sacrificial for uh, those really on the front lines of, of the, the, the dire effects of climate change? And then it's been really challenging. Even in the, Christi the, in the Christian Union, there's opportunity to be self-sacrificial. I remember when um, I was at Christian Union Edinburgh, there was one guy who had the vision that we could cover all the classes um, at the university there. If we had someone in each of those classes who was from the Christian Union stood up for a lecture and told the whole class what event school was about, that was by far one of the most terrifying things I've ever done. Um, probably because I needed to sacrifice my pride and sort of nail my colours to the mast um, that I was the, the Christian guy. Um, but yeah, on the, on the face of it, just doing that so that others could be invited to give a few views of Christ seemed like a, a no brainer. Man, it was, uh, it, was, it was difficult. <laughs> um, but we're also uniquely placed, aren't we, to reach out to those closest to us. So let's consider um, the needs of the people around us. Everyone's got different struggles. Um, so there's careful considerations to be done. Um, for me, for example, is do I want to spend 15 minutes in my lunch break watching the, uh, washing the breakfast and lunch dishes um, so Katie, when she gets home, um, comes home to a clean kitchen? And if she hates doing the dishes. Whereas for Katie, on the other hand, it's how do I make sure we've got enough meals to eat, um, got, um, enough, the clothes and the bed sheets are washed, rooms are clean, uh, because Joel's not great about all that stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> and let's practice self sacrificing behaviors. Um, let me practice anything else. Sure, we'll have days or weeks when we're not at our best, but let's be quick to treat with Jesus again. Springing up to them. And be quick to recognize self serving behaviors in others and encourage uh, them to spur them on. Because encouragement uh, breeds encouragement. And I think we can all think of times when someone said just the right thing to us uh, at just the right time and they've lifted us from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs. But by, look by looking to Christ's example of self sacrifice and applying it, we'll end up looking more like uh, Christ. 